Thank you for joining us today. My name is Omer van de Viever from St. Joseph's Healthcare in London. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Heather McKenzie, a physiatrist here at Parkwood Institute in the Brain Injury Program. Our presentation today is Management of Symptoms of Mild Traumatic Brain Injury, and I will turn it over to Dr. McKenzie. Great, thank you. Thank you, Omer. And uh, I'd also just like to take a moment to thank everyone who's had a hand in organizing this series of talks. And thank you all for having me tonight, and thank you for coming in, and uh, thank you to those of you listening from home as well. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, as Omer said, I'm a physiatrist. So what that means is that I'm a rehabilitation physician, and I specialize in providing care to persons who have had brain injury. And here at Parkwood Hospital in London, I'm very fortunate to work alongside an excellent group of uh, multidisciplinary healthcare professionals. And you'll be hearing from some of them and likely have already heard from some of them through this series of talks. So as you may or may not know, uh, brain injury occurs along a spectrum. And tonight I'm going to be focusing my talk at one end of that spectrum. And I'm going to be talking mainly about mild traumatic brain injury. And I decided to frame my talk tonight around several frequently asked questions that I hear often from patients in my brain injury clinic. And uh, I'll also leave plenty of time at the end uh, for your questions, which as Omar explained, you can type in. And for those of you in the room, we'll just sort of raise hands at the end of the talk. So these are the four questions that I'm going to be going through today. Uh, the first one is, have I had a brain injury? The second one, are my symptoms normal? Third, when will I get better? And fourth, what can I do to get better faster? And I will be spending most of my time today focusing on that last question, number four, because I think that's probably the one that's most pressing and most of interest to the audience members today. So question one, have I had a brain injury? So as I've already mentioned, brain injury occurs along a spectrum. So as a medical practitioner, I like to classify brain injury, and we classify it into three types. So we call it either mild, moderate, or severe. However, I prefer to think about brain injury more as a spectrum rather than these distinct boxes or categories. Um, I do think it is important for me to say, though, that the symptoms that someone experiences after a severe brain injury are not always severe, and the symptoms that someone experiences after a mild brain injury are not always mild. So this classification system is not meant to make a statement on how severely one's life may have been affected after their injury. Diagnosing brain injury, particularly at the mild end of the spectrum, can be a difficult task. And it's primarily based on a review of injury characteristics and is not based on the kinds of symptoms that someone has developed since their injury. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the talk. And in order to gain an appreciation for these injury characteristics, I ask my patients a series of questions pertaining to the day that they sustained their injury. And then I review any medical documentation that's been made available to me from their other healthcare practitioners. So mild traumatic brain injury, it's very common. It's probably the most common neurological condition out there. And 80% of all traumatic brain injury is classified in that mild category that I just talked to you about. The remaining 20% of traumatic brain injury is split rather evenly between the moderate and severe categories. How a brain injury is sustained, that's different for every individual. But the two most common mechanisms that I see in my clinic are falls as well as motor vehicle collisions. But I do see many patients that have been involved in sport-related events, and I do see some patients who may have been assaulted or had other types of mechanisms behind their injury. A person does not necessarily need to hit their head on something to get a brain injury. So that's because it can result from either direct forces to the head or from transmitted forces. A brain injury can occur as a result of acceleration, deceleration, or rotational forces as well, because those can get transmitted to the brain. So this is like what someone might experience if they're involved in a car crash, for example. 
And while there are some individuals when they have their brain injury that do have a loss of consciousness for some period of time, it's also important to know that it's possible to have a brain injury without having any loss of consciousness. So mild traumatic brain injury, it's predominantly a disturbance in brain function. So what that means is that the neural networks are dysfunctional, but they're not necessarily structurally damaged or destroyed. So the traumatic event typically triggers changes at the cellular level, and these affect things like neurotransmitters, which are chemicals in our brain. It affects ions, as well as the metabolism that's happening in our brain. And in most people, these changes are microscopic, which means that we can't see them. So what this also means is that these changes can't usually be seen with our usual neuroimaging techniques, which are CT and MRI. Your doctor may still choose to order brain imaging, particularly if you present early on after your injury. And the main reason for this is to rule out the presence of a brain bleed, which would be more in keeping with a moderate or severe type of brain injury. But importantly, neuroimaging isn't necessary in every individual and won't be performed in every individual. But unfortunately at this time, because of those microscopic changes, we're really unable to confirm the diagnosis of mild traumatic brain injury through either brain scanning or lab testing. But what's exciting is that there's a lot of research going on and advances are being made all of the time. Uh, so there are novel imaging techniques that are under study and are showing lots of promise for being able to distinguish people with mild traumatic brain injury from those without or those who are healthy controls, for example. However, like I've said, these techniques are still being studied and they aren't routinely being used for patient care at the current time. The other thing that's exciting is that because I said that mild traumatic brain injury causes changes at the cellular level, is that researchers are looking into other blood tests that could be used to detect and reliably diagnose mild traumatic brain injury. But again, right now, there isn't anything that's routinely being used in clinical care, but hopefully this will be the way of the future. So my next question, are my symptoms normal? So I think it's important to start by saying that everyone's experience with mild traumatic brain injury is their own and it's unique. But the symptoms that can evolve are varied. Um, but there certainly are patterns of symptoms that I do see commonly in my clinic in people that have had a mild traumatic brain injury. And these symptoms tend to fall into three categories. So I think of them as being physical, behavioral, emotional, and cognitive. So there are some individuals that will have minimal symptoms, whereas others will experience nearly every symptom on the list that I'm presenting to you now. So under physical symptoms, I hear a lot about headaches, nausea, vomiting, visual changes, balance problems and dizziness, as well as sensitivity to light and sound, and some people have ringing or buzzing in their ears. From the behavioral emotional category, I hear a lot about drowsiness, low energy, lethargy. Um, some people tell me they're fear feeling irritable or have a low mood. Some people are anxious, and a lot of people report changes in their sleep patterns, either sleeping more or less than usual. And then in the cognitive domain, people will commonly describe feeling slowed down, foggy, or dazed, and they may have difficulty concentrating or remembering things. So these symptoms that I've just been through with you, unfortunately, they're not specific. So what that means is that the presence of these symptoms doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mild traumatic brain injury, and that's because these same symptoms can be seen as a result of other conditions. So some of these other conditions that can cause these same symptoms would be something like a whiplash injury to the neck. And what's also interesting about whiplash injury is that it can occur as a result of the same mechanism of injury. So that acceleration, deceleration, rotational force that I already described to you previously. And those typically occur in a car accident-like scenario. Um, so you can see again where those lines are sort of blurred from a diagnostic point of view. Uh, but the most important thing and the thing that I really focus on in my clinic is really just managing these symptoms. 
So we'll talk about that a little bit more going forward in the talk. So the next question, when will I get better? So the pattern of recovery following a mild traumatic brain injury, it's variable and it depends on a variety of factors. So some of these are factors that are present even before the injury takes place. So these are factors like someone's age, their gender, and their pre-existing health conditions. And then there's some factors that affect recovery that are related to the injury itself, such as the underlying mechanism of injury. But the bottom line is this is something that's a very hard thing for your physician or your other team members to accurately predict on an individual basis. But we certainly try to take into consideration all of these factors and do our best to advise you. So recovery typically occurs over a period of days to weeks. And uh, the majority of individuals will make their recovery within the first three months after their injury. But this isn't true for everyone, unfortunately. So there's about 15% of individuals who do not recover during this three-month period of time and are prone to experiencing symptoms beyond three months. But the important thing here is, is that these individuals do get better, and they do get better with the passage of time. People can continue to make very noticeable gains, particularly throughout the first two years post-injury. This is the period of time when your brain and mind are really uh, primed to make that recovery. But even beyond two years, I do see individuals that keep making gains. But the rate of improvement tends to slow down beyond that two-year mark. So when I see patients that are continuing to have symptoms beyond the two-year mark, assuming they've had a reasonable course of treatment, I'm often in a position where I'm counseling them on learning to adjust and adapt to a new level of normal. Uh, and that's because these symptoms that are still present at two years are likely to remain persistent to some extent beyond two years. But like I said, there's still room for improvement and people continue to improve for many years after their injury. So the last question and the one we'll focus on a bit more today is what can I do to get better faster? So the first thing I'll present to you here is a symptom management hierarchy. So it's recommended that treatment should first start and be targeted towards the primary symptoms on this symptom hierarchy before moving towards the secondary symptoms. So I tend to focus on these primary symptoms in my clinic, and these are headaches, disordered sleep, and disordered mood. And what I find is that by successfully treating one symptom, it's often the case that improvements in other symptoms occur too. And the other thing is that there are readily available interventions for these symptoms with the potential to yield really significant improvements. So it's for these reasons that I really tend to focus my efforts here to start. But when it comes to symptom management, I frequently encounter patients who are naturally hesitant. Um, for example, when it comes to headaches, some of my patients are worried that by treating their pain, that it's going to put them at higher risk because they figure that their pain, their headache, it's serving some important role at warning them as an important signal that they don't want to miss. And when I'm asked this question, I think it's really important to distinguish between acute pain and chronic pain because pain that's persisted for more than three months, it's no longer adaptive. So pain is often an adaptive thing in the early phase to prevent us from doing things that are harmful but there does come a point when it can become maladaptive and it can prevent us from making the recovery that we're working so hard to achieve. So when pain persists long enough, it can actually make changes in your peripheral and central nervous system that can actually wind up and perpetuate that pain even more. So that's why I think it's very important to consider treatment to really break through that cycle and allow further progress to take place. So the role of a physiatrist, what do I do when it comes to managing mild traumatic brain injury? So I'm often asked to be involved, particularly when there's a question around diagnosis, because we've talked about how that can be tricky. Um, and I'm also asked to be involved, particularly when medication management is being considered. So in my clinics, I tend to see individuals with persistent symptoms. So that means that most of the people I see in my clinic are people who have had their symptoms for more than three months. 
And, you know, sometimes I'm the point of first contact for patients outside of their family physician or emergency room. And um, it's in these cases that I'll frequently make a referral back out to the team or to other therapists in the community because I certainly can't do my job alone. I really need a team to work alongside with. But it's other times that my patients have already seen their team members and they're already working on things and making great gains but their team members have identified um, concerns that they think I could uh, play a role in. So they make a referral directly to me for a specific area of concern. So the bottom line is I focus on primary symptom management and then I work collaboratively with other team members on secondary symptom management. So as I've already pointed out, I really rely heavily on the expertise of my colleagues, particularly when it comes to the management of those secondary symptoms on the list of the symptom hierarchy. So for example, I may refer individuals with mood disturbance to social work or to psychology for a counseling intervention or to psychiatry for further assessment and management of their mood. And I often rely on the therapeutic interventions of physiotherapists for persons who are struggling with dizziness, vertigo, balance impairment, or exercise intolerance. Occupational therapy and speech language therapy are really important interventions for individuals with cognitive impairment, communication difficulties, fatigue, as well as people who are actively working towards returning to work or returning to school. My patients that have prominent visual symptoms may need the expertise of a neurooptometrist, so that's a specialized optometrist that works with people who have neurological conditions. Whereas those patients that I see that have ringing in their ears, noise intolerance, and reduced hearing, they may benefit from seeing an audiologist for hearing testing or having a consultation with an ear, nose, and throat specialist. So when I do my assessment, I'm always looking for who else I may need to involve in my patient's care to make sure that we have the support of a team. Headaches. So headaches are probably one of the most common symptoms after mild traumatic brain injury. And they may in fact be more common among people with mild traumatic brain injury when compared with those with moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. And headaches are associated with a high degree of disability, which is why they're a very important thing to get on top of. And they can interact with other symptoms. So they can interfere with sleep, and this further exacerbates daytime fatigue. And when someone is trying to cope with pain all of the time, they may be more irritable, anxious, or depressed, so it can affect their mood secondarily as well. And also, people that have pain um, can have difficulty paying attention and subsequently have difficulty remembering things. So it can also make cognitive function more difficult. So the majority of people that do have frequent headaches, they do improve with time and they do improve over days, weeks, and months. Um, but there are cases where headaches can be persistent even years after an injury. So when it comes to assessing someone's headaches, um, I usually start by taking a history, which means that I ask a lot of questions, and then I perform a focused physical exam. On the history, I'm interested in understanding when the headache started, how they've been progressing over time, so are they getting better, are they getting worse, are they staying stable? Um, I want to know what kinds of things will make the headache worse or bring the headache on. I want to know what kinds of things make your headaches better or diminish the headaches. I'm inquiring about the quality, so what does the pain feel like? Where is it located? Does it radiate anywhere? I'm also trying to understand how severe the headache pain is. I want to know if there's a certain time of day that the headache happens, how long it lasts when you do get one. I also really want to know what kinds of treatments have already been tried, as well as the specifics around those treatments and the results from those treatments. Um, it's also helpful to me to understand if there's any associated symptoms that come along with the headaches. And all of this information taken together, it helps me understand what kind of headache my patient might be having. For example, are they migraine headaches or are they tension headaches? 
So migraine headaches, they're more likely to be one-sided. They tend to have a pulsating character to them, and they're more likely to be moderate or severe in their intensity and are frequently accompanied by symptoms like nausea or vomiting. Um, also, they can be accompanied by light and sound sensitivity, too. Whereas tension headaches are a little bit different, so they're often described as having a pressing or tightening quality to them and are more likely to be mild or moderate in their severity. Another thing that I take uh, care to do is to closely examine the neck. Uh, that's because we know that dysfunction in the muscles and small joints of the neck can actually cause referred pain to the head and can be a trigger for recurrent headaches. I also examine the back of the head because there's two nerves that come up and they supply sensation to the back of the head, but they can also be a trigger or a stimulus for headaches, particularly when the headaches are located at the back and on the sides of the head. The other thing that's important to note is that some people will have more than one type of headache. Um, so I usually try to separate the different types of headaches so that I can take that all into consideration when I'm determining a treatment plan. And once I've determined the type of headache, that's really what guides the specifics of my treatments. So uh, in terms of treatments, when I'm proposing a management plan, I start with the simplest, lowest risk treatments first, and then I move towards more invasive options. So for headaches, the starting point is lifestyle modifications. And there's quite a few things that can be done that can be beneficial. So when it comes to eating, I counsel my patients about the importance of avoiding delayed or skipped meals. I usually recommend starting with a high protein breakfast in the morning and ensuring that the remainder of your meals are nicely balanced in terms of their nutritional content. If someone isn't able to consume a balanced diet, I do sometimes recommend a multivitamin just to make sure that you're getting all of your nutritional uh, elements. In terms of hydration, it's important that you remain hydrated, having four to six drinks per day, because dehydration can be a significant trigger for headaches, particularly in susceptible individuals. And ideally, these drinks are water. So I usually discourage diet soft drinks in particular because they contain aspartame in most cases, and aspartame can be a significant trigger for headaches as well. I also generally discourage regular daily caffeine consumption, and this is because withdrawal from caffeine can precipitate headaches. So if your body gets used to having a certain level of it, if you miss a coffee or time gets away from you, you might actually have a, a trigger for your headache. But the converse can actually be true to some extent too. So we know that individuals who don't regularly consume caffeinated beverages can actually use a caffeinated beverage to try to abort a headache if it comes on. So the next thing is physical activity. So regular aerobic physical activity is also extremely important. So typically right after a brain injury or a traumatic event, we prescribe a period of rest. And this often means both physical and cognitive rest at first. And this is because we believe that high levels of physical and cognitive exertion early after injury can actually negatively impact on the period of recovery that's happening and may prolong symptom uh, duration. But we also know that prolonged inactivity can be a bad thing too. So that can impede your recovery and make you have secondary problems. So people that are inactive or refrain from their usual activities for too long are prone to feeling more fatigued. They may get a reactive uh, episode of depression and can get physically deconditioned as well. So the newest guidelines are recommending that this period of rest lasts no longer than 24 to 48 hours after an injury before gradually reintroducing regular daily activities. So the reason I talked to you about exercise today is because it's shown to have neuroprotective effects. So I usually recommend aerobic exercise, which is a word I've already used. And what that means is that it's anything that gets your heart rate up and gets you feeling a little bit sweaty. So that's things like walking, using an elliptical machine, cycling, so either a recumbent bike where you're leaning back or a stationary bike. Um, I also really think swimming is a good option here too. But the bottom line is that whatever type of exercise you choose, it should really be individualized because I want you to find something that you actually enjoy doing because what you enjoy doing is something you're more likely to stick with. 
So we've seen that exercise can have beneficial effects on the intensity, frequency, and duration of headaches. But it should be taken uh, on gradually and sort of as tolerated, uh, gradually increasing the duration and intensity over time. So this can be tricky for some people, and many of my patients benefit from working alongside a rehabilitation therapist, a kinesiologist, or a physiotherapist when they're trying to reintroduce physical activity into their uh, regular routine. But for some people, uh, exercise can be a trigger for their headaches. So this is another reason why sometimes people need a therapist to work alongside them because they may need to make tweaks in terms of the intensity, duration, or choose an alternative type of exercise. So pacing and planning. This is likely something that you may have heard about already through these talks, depending on who has presented, but it's something that the team here at Parkwood is really passionate about. And as a concept, it's really about not doing too much all at one time or all in one day in order to conserve your energy. So this may mean for some people scheduling regular rest breaks or varying your activities throughout the day rather than doing any one task for a prolonged sustained period. This can also mean reducing tasks that are particularly exacerbating for your symptoms. But when people don't pace and plan appropriately, they're prone to having days where their symptoms are so severe that they can't engage in any of their regular activities. And that's really what we're trying to avoid. So I often see that after this period where they can't do anything, people are very motivated on the first day that they feel even a little bit better to do all of the things that they may not have been able to do for the previous few days. Um, they really wanna make up for that lost time. But the concept is, is that if you restrict yourself a little bit each day so you don't exceed that ceiling that's limiting you, um, you're less likely to have these down times when you can't really accomplish anything. So you actually maintain better productivity in the medium to long term even though you feel like you're limiting yourself on any one day. And this also keeps your symptoms in better management and allows that ceiling that's holding you back to sort of gradually get higher and higher and higher so that over time you can do more and more and more and are less restricted in terms of your activities. So sleep hygiene. This term really speaks to the practices and habits around achieving a good night's sleep in order to promote appropriate daytime alertness. So sleep deprivation or inconsistent sleep-wake cycles can be precipitants for headache or preclude improvement in someone who's struggling with headaches on a regular basis. So some of the things that I recommend to my patients is going to sleep and waking up at the same time every day and establishing a fixed bedtime routine. So doing the same thing every night, like clockwork, before you go to bed. Uh, this is because you really want to start a routine that signals to your brain that this is time to go to bed, this is what I do every night before I go to bed. And I usually discourage daytime napping as well. But certainly this isn't feasible for all people and some people do need a rest in the day. So if naps can't be avoided, I usually recommend limiting them to one per day, keeping them shorter than 30 minutes in duration, and taking them earlier in the day, so before 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And if you're going to nap, you should nap in bed, because we're really trying to consolidate the relationship you have between sleep and bed. And if you sleep in other places in your house and don't sleep in your bed, you're just confusing your mind and body even more, and that can add to your uh, difficulties over time. I also suggest avoiding things like caffeine and sugar, particularly within sort of the four to six hours before bedtime. And similarly, heavy meals should be avoided late at night before bed. And I've talked a lot about exercise, but try to avoid doing that late in the evening. That's preferably done earlier in the day. And stress. So this is another factor that can be an important precipitant or something that can worsen the headaches that someone is already dealing with. So what I like to do is make sure that my patients have some relaxation strategies in their toolbox that are gonna help them cope day to day with the stresses that we all experience. So these are things like meditation, breathing exercises, or a yoga practice. It's different for every person, but these are some of the things that I discuss with my patients. 
And mindfulness is another thing. So mindfulness is the concept about being truly present and focused on the current moment rather than allowing our minds to wander towards the future and the past. And this can be quite helpful in managing symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. And, you know, some people are hesitant about meeting with a counselor or aren't able to make contact with a counselor. So I sometimes recommend a book called Mindfulness for Beginners, which is by John Kabat-Zinn. Um, and it's a workbook that people can work through quite independently to help learn some of these mindfulness concepts. So these are a list of some other pretty conservative techniques that people can use to help manage their headaches on their own. So some people will put a hot or a cold pack to the uh, head or neck. Some of my people find that tying something tight around the head can be beneficial. I often recommend some self-massage or introducing regular stretches for the neck and shoulders. Um, people will go outside and get a bit of fresh air to help manage their headaches. Also, um, frequently people with headaches will feel the need to lie down and rest in a quiet, dark place. And these mindfulness strategies that I just discussed can also be quite beneficial for managing pain. So something else, I've talked a little bit about how the neck can produce some similar symptoms to concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. And with that in mind, it's important to address the neck um, because the neck problems can be precipitating headaches. So people who do have trouble with their neck can often benefit from active physiotherapy. So what I mean by active physiotherapy, that is physiotherapy that your therapist teaches you how to do for yourself. So those are things like stretches and strengthening exercises that you can work into a regular daily routine to help keep the muscles of your neck long and lean as well as strong and balanced. So usually by the time I see people in my clinic, since I do tend to see people later in their journey with brain injury, many people have tried these strategies and already have a bit of a sense as to which ones are helpful and which ones are not, because it is, a, it is an individualized thing. So now moving a little bit further along the spectrum in terms of things that we might do to help with headaches. So many of my patients are interested in what kinds of natural things they can do to help reduce their headaches. And there are some supplements that have been studied, although they haven't been specifically studied in headaches after brain injury, but they have been studied in headaches in general. Um, so specifically, there's some evidence to support the use of magnesium, vitamin B2, alpha lipoic acid, and coenzyme Q10. So all of these elements, they play an important role at the cellular level in that metabolism. And that's where I talked about where mild traumatic brain injury can have its effects. And each of these agents has been shown to reduce the frequency and severity of headaches. But they do need to be taken regularly, so they're not like a uh, Tylenol or an Advil where you can take them when you get a headache. They're meant to be taken every day. Generally, I think there is pretty minimal downside to trying things like supplements other than the associated cost if you invest in them and take them and they don't work. Um, the only thing I would caution you is that magnesium, when taken at moderate or high doses, can give people diarrhea and gastric irritation, so just be cautious with that. So the next point on my slide here is about abortive medications. So what I mean by that is that these are pills that you would take when you get a headache to try to give you relief from that headache. So examples of this would be acetaminophen or Tylenol, aspirin, or ibuprofen, Advil. And there's also a group of prescription medications. They're called triptans. And these are meant to be taken at the first sign of a migraine-type headache. So depending on the type of headache you have, that might be another option for you. But the thing about these abortive medications is that they're not meant to be taken all of the time or very frequently. So their use should be limited to no more than three times per week usually, because if you use them too often, they can actually perpetuate and actually lead to more chronic headaches in some people. So we call these rebound headaches or medication overuse headaches. And these can even happen if you're using these medications for some other indication, like many people will have back pain 
after a car accident as well as a mild traumatic brain injury. And if you take these medications regularly, even for your back pain, they can still wreak havoc on your headaches. So a pattern of use that is a little bit less likely to cause the medication overuse headaches is bunching. So these headache, uh, these headache medications are meant to be used for sort of a few days at a time and then not used again for several weeks or even months. So that pattern is a little bit less risky, but it's the regular every day, multiple times a day or multiple times a week pattern that is a bit worrisome. So sometimes to get a sense of this, I'll ask my patients to fill out a blank calendar and that helps you know, myself as well as them understand what their medication use patterns are like and also what their headache patterns are like. So um, the other thing about these abortive medications is that they also, you know, while many of them are over the counter, they are also not without their own risks. So particularly the anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen or Advil or Motrin, uh, these medications can also cause gastric irritation. So that's irritation in the lining of the stomach. And in some people can give you, in some people can give ulceration or ulcers. So again, another good reason why they aren't meant to be taken very regularly. So um, other things that I recommend, I sometimes recommend using topical creams. And these are particularly beneficial for people who have headaches that are coming from their neck. Um, so what I'm talking about with these creams, so some people will use like a BioFreeze, which is something you can get over the counter at uh, many uh, pharmacies. And it, it usually has like a menthol component to it and will give you a cooling sensation, but it isn't really medicated. Um, there are other creams that are medicated, so I'll often recommend a trial of something called Volterran Emil Gel. It's a topical cream that has an anti-inflammatory like medication in it that's like your Advil, but where you rub it on the skin, sort of over the neck and the upper parts of the shoulders, it is delivered directly where you want it to be. So it doesn't have to pass through your stomach, so you're not going to get those risks I just talked about with the stomach irritation and the ulcers. So that's one thing that I like about it. Um, there's also a couple other prescription medicated creams that you could talk to your doctor about if this is something that you are benefiting from that could be used as an alternative to the Volterin. The next point on my slide here is uh, prophylactic medication. So what I mean by that is pills that are taken every day, even on days if you don't have a headache, because they're meant to prevent the headache from happening in the first place or in an overall way tone down the headaches. So all of the medications that I use for this purpose weren't designed to be used for headaches. These are medications that were designed for some other reason, and in our years of using them, we've learned that they can prevent and help people with their headaches. So these are medications like anti-seizure medications or antidepressant medications, and even some blood pressure lowering medications are the ones that I typically use for this purpose. And I make my choice about what agent I'm going to use based on um, the other problems that my patient is having, as well as the type of headaches that I think they're displaying. The, the reason I uh, incorporate information about the other symptoms they're having into this decision-making process is because the side effects of these medications can actually be beneficial for some of the other symptoms that people are having. And that's because these medications can help with things like the sensory sensitivities that many of my patients have. So that's the sensitivity to light and sound. Um, and some people it can help turn down the tinnitus. So that's the ringing or buzzing in the ears. And they can also help people with falling and staying asleep. So there's lots of benefits to these medications, even though I may be introducing it from the point of view of helping with headaches. So I usually recommend these kinds of medications when uh, people are having headaches that are occurring more than three times a week. So that's that threshold when I sort of shift from taking abortive medications to taking a preventative medication. Um, I also consider them if headaches are just way too disabling or when we've tried abortive medications but they haven't worked or you're needing to use those abortive medications too often. Uh, sometimes abortive medications aren't well tolerated for some of the reasons I've discussed, like stomach upset, and that's another reason that I might turn to these preventative medications. 
Um, and also there's some medical contraindications to using certain medications and that's why I might turn to other ones. So those are all reasons that I might look at recommending an everyday medication for someone. But unfortunately these medications aren't a cure. Uh, the goal again is to try to decrease the headache frequency, intensity or duration as well as reduce the need for taking other medications like your Tylenol and Advil. And unfortunately, patients might not perceive any benefit from these medications for many weeks. So it does take weeks to build up a level of this medication in your system in order to reap the benefits. And even longer than that, you may need to wait up to 12 weeks to reach the maximal benefit from these medications. So it is a slow process. It's not immediate, unfortunately. And if this medication is helpful, I often get asked, am I going to be on this forever for the rest of my life? And the answer is no. Um, these medications are a tool that are designed to sort of help turn down symptoms enough so that you can participate in other uh, therapies, so that you can um, go through your day-to-day -day routine with more ease, but they can always be taken away at any time. And also, as you make your recovery, you may not need these medications forever. So what I usually recommend is keeping them on board for sort of three to six months if they've been helpful, and then trial gradually decreasing the dose and weeding them off. And it's at that point in time when it becomes clear whether it's something that is really required at that point in time or whether you no longer need it or whether you need it but just at a lower dose. And the last point on this slide is around injectable treatments. So there are a few different options in this category as well. So I mentioned those occipital nerves at the back of the head earlier, and sometimes what I'll do is an injection around those nerves to sort of cover them in a medication that turns them down. These are called nerve blocks. And the other thing that I commonly do are trigger point injections. So these are injections into the muscles of the neck and shoulder region when those muscles are irritated and when I think those muscles are provoking headaches. For both of these injections, the trigger point injections and the nerve block injections, I use a local anesthetic. So that's like a lidocaine. So the same kind of thing you might get at the dentist to give a cavity filled, for example. And these injections for a period of hours create a numbness, but when they're effective, they may benefit you for a period of weeks. Uh, so unfortunately, the effects are usually temporary but they can be a good tool to use if you can take advantage of that temporary period of benefit. So if during that few weeks where things are less severe, you can engage more actively in your rehabilitation or you can perform better at work, for example, those are all good reasons to consider these in interventions even if they are just temporary. And then for patients that I see that I think have migraine type headaches, I may offer a trial of botulinum toxin or Botox injections. So at this point in time, Botox, it's only approved for migraine type headaches, but there is uh, some evidence that we're learning more and more every day about how it can work for other types of headaches as well. So usually when Botox injections are performed, they help about 75% of people who have them done. And when they're beneficial, the effect can last several months. Um, so the injections, if beneficial, would be repeated every three to four months or even longer, depending on how long the person benefits for. So now we're going to change gears a little bit and we'll talk a bit more about disordered sleep. So that's another one of those primary symptoms that I spend a lot of time working on in my clinic. So approximately 50% of individuals suffer from sleep disturbances after their mild traumatic brain injury. And sleep disturbances can take different forms in different individuals. So this can mean sleeping too much, sleeping too little, delayed sleep onset, snoring, poor sleep maintenance, so waking up a lot during the night, um, or even waking up too early in the morning and being unable to get back to sleep. And poor sleep can be secondary to a variety of factors. So it may be due to physical problems. So people that have neck pain and headaches naturally have trouble sleeping. It could be due to emotional difficulty. So a lot of people that have anxiety or low mood will have a lot of thoughts at night that make it hard to turn their brain off and turn it down in order to rest. 
And it can also be related to concurrent medical issues like sleep apnea or other hormonal disturbances. But the bottom line is that like our headaches, disordered sleep can worsen other symptoms that you're simultaneously trying to get on top of. So you can end up with worse psychological distress, worse pain, worse fatigue, and worse cognitive function when you're sleeping poorly. So that's why it's a really important thing for us to work towards improving because again, improvements in sleep can improve all of these other areas like your mood, pain, energy, and cognition. So when I'm assessing someone who's having trouble with their sleep, I begin by asking a series of questions that really help me figure out where the difficulty lies. So in my mind, I often think about sleep problems as falling into three broad categories. So I'm looking at trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, or waking up too early. And I'll ask questions about what someone's habits are in the evening before they go to bed. I'm also interested in what someone does when they can't sleep or when they wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. And I'm also looking at other factors that can affect someone's sleep-wake cycle, such as their personal habits, their other medical conditions, and their other medications. Blood work is something that I use to help me rule out other underlying treatable causes of fatigue. So those are things like a low thyroid, things like a low hemoglobin or anemia, and other hormonal disturbances. And sometimes I'll order a sleep study if I'm suspicious of a sleep-related breathing disorder like obstructive sleep apnea. So again, similar to my approach to headaches, I begin with simple non-invasive treatments first. And this often starts with really optimizing somebody's sleep environment. So ideally the bedroom should be dark, cool, quiet, and kept clean and tidy. And the bedroom and bed should be reserved for sleep. And for that reason, I recommend no electronic equipment in the bedroom. So I usually recommend that any activities there are, like watching TV, using the computer, surfing the internet, happen in another room rather than in the bedroom. And any electronic equipment that does come into the bedroom, like cell phones, for example, should be turned off or put on sleep mode when you're going to sleep so that they don't buzz or vibrate and wake you up unnecessarily. The other thing is about digital clocks. So there's a lot of digital clocks out there now that shine sort of bright lights and numbers. Um, many people will have them, and I usually recommend actually turning them away from the bed so that you're not waking up and seeing a bright light and also to try to discourage you from looking at the clock if you do wake up in the night, because that can often just trigger a lot of thoughts about, oh my goodness, I have to wake up in two hours, why aren't I sleeping? Um, so you want to try to avoid looking at the clock if you do wake up in the night. And likely, like we discussed already with headaches, sleep hygiene again is obviously really important for sleep. So again, you want to establish a fixed bedtime routine. So that usually means quiet, relaxing activities before bed and avoiding any bright lights. So by bright lights, I mean screens, so TV, computer, cell phone. Um, I usually recommend allowing at least one hour before you go to bed to sort of unwind and calm down from the day's activities. And again, avoiding things like caffeine, alcohol, heavy meals, and sugar too close to bedtime. I do hear from a lot of patients that having sort of a small drink of alcohol or something like that before bed helps them get to sleep because it does make you drowsy. But I usually discourage this for, you know, many reasons. But one of them has to do with the fact that although alcohol will make you drowsy and help you fall asleep, when we have alcohol, it can produce more frequent awakenings and a lighter sleep overall. So I definitely discourage its use before bed. And the other thing is that we generally recommend to our patients after brain injury that they abstain from alcohol for about two years. So that's another good reason not to turn to alcohol for help with sleep. So again, I'd recommend considering a bedtime snack that considers protein, if you like, uh, that includes protein, if you'd like to have something before bed. And using this bedtime routine to sort of set you up for feeling sleepy because Ideally, you shouldn't get into bed until you are feeling sleepy because, again, we're trying to consolidate that relationship between your bed and bedroom and feeling sleepy rather than feeling awake. 
So once you've gone to bed, if you're having trouble falling asleep or if you've woken and can't fall back asleep and this has lasted for 15 or 20 minutes, I usually recommend getting up out of bed and going and doing something different. So again, if you lie in your bed awake for hours at a time, your brain is confused about what you're supposed to be doing in bed. Am I supposed to lie awake or am I supposed to sleep? So don't lie in bed for prolonged periods of time awake. Get up, leave the room, go do something else that again is quiet and relaxing and calming, and then come back and try to sleep again in another 15 or 20 minutes. Again, the same bed and wait time should uh, bed and wake times should be maintained daily. So you want to have a schedule. So that means that even in the morning, if you've had a terrible night's sleep, you should get up at the same time. And during the day, try to expose yourself to natural light. I know that this is sometimes stimulating for some people's symptoms if they're sensitive to light, but that natural light is part of our body's own rhythm about day and night. Again, we've talked about avoiding daytime naps, and if that isn't feasible, keeping them limited to no more than one per day, no more than half an hour in length earlier in the day, so before 3 o'clock, and taking them in bed. And that's because if we nap too long, I'm sure many of you, and myself included, can relate to this. If you wake up from a long nap or a deep sleep, you feel very groggy and slow and have trouble sort of processing things and concentrating for a little while. So by keeping your naps short, you kind of avoid having that period of time uh, where you feel groggy. And this can even last upwards of an hour after a long nap. So the other thing uh, I'd like to talk about today is about energy conservation. So people who have disturbed sleep naturally feel fatigued during the day. So conserving the energy that you do have during the day is very important. So you know, if you think of yourself as a vehicle or a car, if your tank's only half full when you start the day, you really need to conserve that to maximize your function. So what this comes down to, again, is that pacing and planning concept I alluded to earlier. So taking regular breaks and not overdoing any one activity or anything on any one day to try to maintain your productivity throughout the week. And again, regular exercise. So again, this is vital, even for people who are feeling fatigued as a result of their poor sleep. So exercise is kind of interesting. So when you expend energy exercising, you often get more back in return. So exercise is actually usually an energizing type activity rather than a fatiguing one. But it's certainly a hard thing to start when you're already feeling slowed down and lethargic and like you don't have enough energy for your day-to-day -day activities. So what I'm usually trying to work people towards is a goal of 30 to 60 minutes of exercise every day. But you can't start there, particularly if you're not being active on a regular basis already. So I usually recommend starting slowly and gradually increasing that over time. Um, you may not ever get to this goal of 30 to 60 minutes every day, and that's okay, but any exercise that you do is better than not exercising at all. But again, try to avoid exercising too close to bedtime. And for that reason, I do typically recommend exercising in the morning. Uh, it's a great way to start your day and really sets you up for success for the rest of the day in terms of your energy and will likely help with your sleep later on at night too. So um, we're coming close to the end here. So this is my last slide pertaining to sleep. Um, and then we'll move on to some questions. But uh, one thing I'd like to point out is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is another excellent non-medication treatment that can help people, particularly who are having insomnia. So that means not sleeping enough. So what this looks like is usually working one-on-one -on -one or in a group with a therapist. And what the goal of this therapy is, is to reestablish that relationship that I've been talking about between your bed and bedroom as a stimulus for sleep. It can also address any maladaptive thoughts and dysfunctional beliefs that can interfere with sleep. And it works to eliminate some of those habits that I've talked about today that are counterproductive to sleep. And they usually also often introduce relaxation training as a component of the CBT program. In terms of uh, natural supplements, again, there's some evidence in the literature, particularly for magnesium and zinc. Uh, but one of the things that I often recommend a trial of would be melatonin. 
So melatonin, it's a naturally occurring hormone. Our bodies all make it. And it's released in the evening in response to an absence of light. So that's, again, why I've talked to you so much today about avoiding bright lights and stimulating things like TV and screens in the evening because our body isn't meant to have that much light at that time of the day, and it really can interfere with our body's own hormonal responses. But what melatonin does is it works to induce sleepiness and help you fall asleep. So I usually recommend trialing anywhere from 3 to 12 milligrams before bed for that. In terms of other medications, there's numerous prescription medications that can be used to assist with sleep. And importantly, some medications that your doctor may use for other indications can make you drowsy as a side effect. And administering these medications at bedtime can actually help you take advantage of that side effect to help with your sleep. For example, I talked about some of those headache preventative medications earlier. So some of my first choices for those are either amitriptyline or nortriptyline, which are antidepressant medications by class. But when we use them at low doses, you're not really getting the antidepressant, but you are getting the pain-reducing effect. But one of the main side effects of these medications is they make people sleepy and drowsy. So we administer them at night, and in addition to helping with your headaches, they can help with sleep initiation and maintenance. Another medication that I often use in my practice because it can have a dual impact is mirtazapine or Remeron. So this is also an antidepressant by class. And when I'm using it, I'm using it because I think that someone would benefit from its mood 